yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. This is Patrick. Whew. I'll be honest. That was the first game all season that I was super pissed about. I'm talking about the loss to the Charlotte Hornets, where the Warriors had a double-digit lead again, second game in a row, second night in a row, and then couldn't hold it. And then a series of, let's say, mishaps at the end of the game, and Terry Rozier, scary Terry, hits a game-winning jumper, time expires, Warriors go out with another L, back-to-back losses. That sucked. I was so pissed. And I'd actually forgotten what it's like to be pissed about a Warriors loss. The season has been so much for me about thinking about the future and next season and developing James Wiseman. And with low expectations in terms of not being a real contender, I was like, okay, I just want to see progress and growth from game to game, from player to player, from the team overall. Once Clay went down with the Achilles, you kind of had to say to yourself, well, no title contention this year. But let's go back to the very beginning. So it was really weird because Steph, he was all set to play in the game and it seemed like he was just about to walk out onto the court. But then as the Warriors were huddling up, Steph walks off. At first, I was like, oh my God, something is wrong with him. It looked like he was walking funny and I thought he had like a leg injury. But looking at it again on replays and on Twitter, it looked like his walking funny was just him kind of, you know, being Steph and stomping off with a funny like gait. And then I was like, oh, is he sick? Does he have COVID? And apparently he does not. That's what the Warriors PR and that's what the coaches and that's what, you know, the Warriors organization said. So that's good. He wasn't pulled for that reason. And I actually thought that he was pulling a Paul Pierce and he actually had to go to the bathroom or something. (laughs) You know, the famous Paul Pierce finals wheelchair thing, getting carried off. The dude had had to take a dump. But that was strange because I was like, hey, why is Michael Mulder in the game? And then I was like, wait a second, where's Steph? And I was listening to the Charlotte Hornets broadcast because I wanted to hear Del Curry talk about his son. He does color commentary for the Charlotte Hornets, and he didn't even know. Neither of them knew. And the play-by-play guy was like, hey, Del, where's Steph? And Del was like, I don't know. I have no idea. He made a joke about, you want me to text him or something? And he probably should have. But that that was strange. Hopefully nothing serious. It seems like he's going to be playing in the next game against the the Knicks. So fingers crossed on that. But as my good friend Chung pointed out, this is three years in a row that Steph has not played the one game that the Warriors play in Charlotte every year. And so he's missed it. He's missed three games, three seasons in a row in Charlotte playing in his hometown. So that that kind of sucks. Once he went out, I figured, well, their most potent offensive weapon is out, so I figured they'd have to play really great defense. That would be their chance of winning the game. And they did well enough to stay close and to build a double-digit lead towards the end of the game, but again, they let it slip away. Now, this is different from the Orlando game because in the Orlando game, the Warriors put in all their starters with Steph, and he's the closer, and he just couldn't close it out. It wasn't just his fault, but that starting unit, closing out the Orlando game, just couldn't do it. But this game, it was a hodgepodge because they were down Steph, and obviously they're already down Wiseman and Looney. And they just had a couple bad offensive possessions towards the end of the game. And in crunch time, they just took some bad shots and could not put the Hornets away. Give credit to the Hornets for fighting back and staying in it and hitting shots when they were given the opportunity. Rogier just couldn't freaking miss. So, you know, credit to that guy. But man, that final, final minute where Wanamaker thought he was going to get fouled. And so he just hugs the ball and puts his head down like he was a running back about to run through a defensive line. I mean, sorry, but what the hell was that? He should know that the first thing they're going to do is try to get a jump ball. Don't just assume the foul and don't put your head down, man. That was frustrating. I know a lot of fans are 
kind of tired of Brad Wanamaker. Uh, he didn't have a very good shooting game, but the guy is sturdy. He had some good defensive moments, and that was just a really, really weird play. He just assumed that that's what the Hornets were going to do. I'm sorry, if you put your head down, they're just going to try to grab the ball and get a jump ball. Like, you can't just stop moving and just turtle up. So they lost that jump ball, and then it led to Gordon Hayward ending up on the ground and Draymond Green locking him up. Everybody in the universe thought it was going to be a jump ball, but then the refs awarded the Hornets a timeout. Okay, rarely do I get into the refs because that's just a fool's game for fans, you know? Fans can always complain about refs, but that just seemed like a very, very iffy call. By the time Gordon Hayward was on the ground and had quote-unquote possession by the eye test on multiple replays, Draymond already had his hands on the ball too. If the timeout was called, it was before Hayward had possession then, not afterwards. And in that case, you can't call that timeout. So that was a bad call, but then Draymond being Draymond, he loses his shit (laughs) and gets two techs and gets booted from the game. The Warriors at this point were up two, and you're like, okay, they can win the game, but Draymond's technicals give Rozier two free technicals. At the free throw line, he hits both, and then game starts up again. No Draymond running the defense. Nine seconds left. Rozier looks like he kind of double dribbles or carries the ball or gets the ball stuck on his knee, and to me, you got to call one of those, but whatever. But he drains the jumper. He drains the long two-point shot right in front of the Warriors bench, and it's over. You live and you learn. You move on. Like my friend Aram in Toronto, huge Warriors fan who is on this show sometimes, says, he said to me after the game, hey, you take the good with the bad with Draymond. Yeah, that's totally true, and we've had more good, but like, man, you're 31, 32 years old. Like, I get it. You lose it, but where's the context, you know? At this point, where is that awareness? I'm sure he knows what he did. I heard all the post-game interviews. I read the stuff. Steve Kerr saying like he didn't like the call either, but Draymond can't do that. Eric Paschal saying that Draymond took the blame for the loss, but then backtracking and kind of saying he didn't say it was for the loss. But I don't know what he was saying then that Draymond was saying was his fault. I mean, maybe getting the two texts and getting ejected, that's his fault. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, that kind of leads to the loss. So anyway, whatever. But that's the thing. If Draymond doesn't get those two techs, they're up two with nine seconds left. Yes, you can still lose the game, but you are ahead. And who knows? Maybe the refs give you like a makeup call because they blew that jump ball so egregiously. But instead, you just kind of hand it over. Yes, this was an awful time for Draymond to lose his shit, but not just in the game, but on this road trip. Because you had a tough loss in Orlando just last night. Then this game, this could have been a bright spot. Without Steph last second, you come back, you hang tough, you get a lead, and you win. But no, now you're 0-2 on the road. And you have two more relatively tough ones, right? The Knicks aren't world beaters, but they're definitely playing tough. They beat the Warriors last time, and they're at home. And then you get a Pacers team that boxed and won Steph Curry to death. I mean, there's a chance they go 1-3 and on this road trip or maybe even 0-4, which would be kind of a mini disaster, or maybe like a legit disaster, considering I said in a few episodes before this road trip, like this is a soft spot in their schedule where they could rack up quite a few wins. I mean, quite a few, relatively speaking, in terms of this weird COVID season. I actually dreamt, I dreamt that they could come back from this road trip 20 and 13. I mean, at least they could have maybe come back 19 and 14. And they'd have a decent hold of the middle of the pack in the playoff race. I guess on the bright side, you could say that this helps them in their quest to thread the needle to A, make the playoffs, and then B, keep their own first round pick that is top 20 protected. Otherwise, it goes to the Oklahoma City Thunder in the Kelly Oubre trade. So that's fine. If that's what ends up happening, then cool. But This is just a frustrating loss because this was game 31. The whole season was like, let's see who the Warriors are after 20 to 30 games. But this game, it didn't have Steph. It didn't have Wiseman. It didn't have Looney. It didn't have Marquise Chris, of course, either. So what are they? I mean, they have moments where they're starting to look good and injuries are hitting every team and people are sitting out because of COVID all over the league. That's part of what makes this season so goddamn strange. 
we were starting to see an identity, you know, and it might take another 10 games to see that. Again, love Draymond Green, ride with that dude to the very end. But this was very, very, very questionable. And I think everybody knows it should not have done that. And I guess you just got to move on. Luckily, this wasn't a playoff game or another game five of the NBA finals. I'm sure he'll make up for it very, very soon. But yeah, it took me a while to cool off from this game. And it had been a while since I'd gotten that worked up. I just really, really wanted this win. They really deserved this. And this would have been a totally pleasant surprise because they fought hard. Andrew Wiggins played well again, and Kelly Oubre played really, really well again, which, as I said, after the Orlando loss, makes you really think they should sell high. I like the dude, and if they really, really want to, quote unquote, go for it next season, and if they really, quote unquote, feel like they owe it to Steph Curry to put everything on the line, then hell, keep Kelly Oubre, pay him, go way, way deep into the tax, And have a deeper stable of wings. Like I said, if you have a small ball lineup of Steph, Clay, Wiggins, Oubre, and Draymond, I mean, that is death lineup light. You know what I mean? But if you want to look at him as an asset and trade high, then now or obviously before the trade deadline might be the best time. Hey, it's Joe Lacob's money. If fans are allowed in in the next year and a half, then awesome. Then maybe they'll start making money hand over fist again. They'll be like, yes, let's pay Ubre. Let's have this crazy exorbitant team salary and just go for it. That would be a damn good team. (laughs) I would love to see that. Anyway, like I said, the Knicks are up next, a team that the Warriors lost to. I think people are saying James Wiseman and Kevon Looney are going to be back and Steph is going to be back too. So I feel good about that, just the prospect of watching those guys play once again and the Warriors having the majority of their team back together. I'm sure there's going to be rust. I'm sure there's going to be conditioning issues. And I'm very curious to see if Wiseman has learned anything by sitting on the sideline for so long. Seems like a smart guy, very observant guy. Can he apply any of the stuff he said in interviews that he's seen from Looney before Looney got hurt from other teams? Uh, from watching Juan Toscano Anderson play or anything like that. Anyway, this was very, very therapeutic to talk about. <laughs> so thanks for uh, for riding it out with me. That is another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Patrick Epino, E-P-I-N-O, or at Oakland Warriors. Check us out at oaklandwarriors.com. And be sure to share this podcast with your fellow warrior fan friends the oakland warriors podcast is produced by national film society that's it music in this episode provided by paper sun special thanks to paul amardo for production support see you next time